Okay, folks, so welcome to lesson 10, the third last lesson for unit two, the light reactions of photosynthesis. So the important thing to consider here at the end of the day is that comparison between uh, aerobic respiration as well as photosynthesis and understanding the context of how those two things compare. So recall that photosynthesis, the photosynthetic reaction is the combination of carbon dioxide and water along with sunlight energy to produce the glucose molecule and oxygen that we all utilize in some way, shape, or form as a, uh, as a species of eukaryotic cells that rely on external food sources. So the increase in gas of oxygen, that oxygen gas on Earth allowed for aerobic life to flourish. When you think about millions upon millions upon hundreds of millions, even billions of years ago, there was no... Uh, gas version of oxygen found on the planet. It was all stored in carbon in some way, shape, or form. And plants had a really great way, once they evolved, to utilize that carbon, to fix that carbon into sugar and then create oxygen as a byproduct. It allowed for that aerobic life to flourish. So it's interesting to think about it in terms of that. But when looking at light-dependent reactions, we need to remember that those light-dependent reactions are going to occur in the chloroplast specifically on that thylakoid membrane that we looked at this morning, okay? That thylakoid membrane holds all of those light capturing and light harnessing molecules and structures that allow for a plant to take that light energy and convert it into a sugar and oxygen. So at the end of the day, um, at the end of the day, it's important to recognize the combination of, of that chloroplast and that thylakoid. And, and just to answer that question that was just asked, um, they created that oxygen themselves, essentially. Um, it was a little bit different. When I say that there was little to no oxygen on the planet, there was still some oxygen on the planet that they could utilize, um, but they had to create the vast majority of it in order to utilize it. So we'll talk, we don't really talk about the historical aspects of photosynthesis as a whole in terms of how it's changed over the millennia, so to speak. Um, but the vast majority of oxygen that we have if not 95% of that oxygen that we have in our atmosphere today uh, was and is produced at by plants. Okay, so what is the goal of our light-dependent reactions? It's to capture that energy. It's to capture that light energy in those photosystems, the proteins, pigments, what have you. Uh, photosystems 2 and 1 are the two photosystems we're going to look at. And it's going to convert that chemical energy into... Um, that electron energy, and that's gonna move it from that electron transport complex in the form of high energy electrons. So eventually it's going to form ATP and NADPH, which is again, that electron carrier molecule, which are both needed in the light independent reactions of the Calvin cycle. So the ATP that it produces as a result of um, that light reaction, it also is gonna produce something called NADPH, which both of those will be utilized in the Calvin cycle to make sugar, essentially. So let's take a look at those photosystems, specifically photosystem two, and how it is responsible for splitting water. Also, the Calvin cycle occurs in the stroma to make sugar, but we'll talk more about that as we move to the Calvin cycle tomorrow. So photosystem two and its ability to split water. So photosystem two is interesting because it allows for water to be kind of to be split essentially to kind of utilize that water um to utilize that water to produce some things later and, and i'll talk about why they called it photosystem two uh it, a little bit later but it is it is something that was discovered after photosystem one but it turns out it was more important than photosystem one but we'll talk about yeah exactly uh so in photosystem two we have that reaction center, that primary electron acceptor, okay? It's also going to have something called P680, which is chlorophyll A, and it's able to transfer that uh, electron, that, that, elect, that charged electron. So in that reaction center, we're going to have the location, uh, that reaction center that allows for a redox reaction to occur, all right? So that redox reaction will occur, and it's going to give that electron and take some hydrogen, oxygen, what have you. And then that energy, that energy can then be used 
That energy can then be used by those accessory pigments as well as something called PQ, which is an electron shuttle, and it can transport it. It can transport it along an electron shuttle. And as a result of its transporting along an electron shuttle, it can allow for that breakdown of H2O into hydrogen and oxygen. So let's take a look at how that works. So this kind of answers your question, Sarmad, of where do they get that oxygen from? It, it stems from this process of breaking down that water. So water is split into hydrogen ions, which remain within the lumen. It's also going to have an electron that is captured by the primary electron acceptor and passed through that electron uh, transport chain. And then it will also have oxygen, which is eventually released or used later on by the plant's cells for cellular respiration. It's really good at recycling, essentially. So in photosystem two, or PS2, pigments, chlorophyll B and carotenoids, in the antenna complex absorb a photon of light and transfer that molecule to molecule 680 found in the reaction center. Remember, as electrons move from excited to ground state, they release that energy, and that energy is passed between pigments, and okay, that energy is passed between pigments. This causes an electron in that P680 to move from ground to excited state, making it energized. This excited, right, again, recall that it is going to have an excited state. So this excited state, this electron is then transferred to the primary acceptor molecule, that chlorophyll A, making it a primary acceptor uh, negative, making that primary acceptor negative, and the 680 positive. It's as a result of that movement of the electron. So that general charge, that general charge of the primary electron acceptor now is negative as a result of taking that electron, that one single electron makes it negative, and the P680, that P680, which causes that electron, uh, or that, that gives that electron to that electron acceptor is now gonna be seen as positive. Now, why is it important in that context? Well, we really need to think about it in terms of how they attract electrons okay p680 p680 is chlorophyll a it's got it's just basically a fancy name for a bunch of chlorophyll a so p680 is going that being being positive will attract electrons from splitting of that hydrogen dioxide or dihydrogen oxide or that water so when you think about how important it is for the regeneration cycle of certain molecules or the regeneration of certain electron acceptors and donors, it's important to recognize that that P680 on average is highly electronegative, okay? It's highly electronegative. Yes, chlorophyll A is the electron acceptor, but P680 helps to facilitate that. So it, 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 that transfer from that P680, as it moves from ground to excited state, it allows for it to go then go back down to ground state and then give its electron to chlorophyll A, which is the final electron acceptor, okay? So if you wanna think about it in terms of what is more electronegative, chlorophyll A is more electronegative than P680. So since P680 has a very strong pull on electrons, highly electronegative, it can also remove electrons from water molecules. So with the help of that water splitting enzyme complex, it makes it neutral again. So because we've looked at that P680 as a means to attract electrons from this process, as that water is split it, with the help of that complex, that water splitting complex enzyme, it helps make that P680 less electronegative once it takes on an electron, okay? Because you have to re realize once something gets that electron, it's gonna become less electronegative. So the primary acceptor molecule will then transfer its electron to a molecule of what's called plastoquinine, PQ, an electron shuttle in the thylakoid membrane, making the electron acceptor neutral, and it will be able to receive another electron from that P680 when another photon is absorbed. So think of the context, or if you wanna think of the process, start to finish, chlorophyll A is highly electronegative, right? So is that P680. Once that P680 gets an electron, it's less electronegative, okay? Once that P680 gets an electron, it's less electronegative. So now it's like, okay, I gotta get, I'm happy. I have this electron. I'm not as electronegative anymore. It then comes close to that chlorophyll A or that primary acceptor, which is significantly more electronegative. And it's like, oh, okay, 
Well, I guess uh, I'm going to pass on that electron to that primary acceptor. That then makes the electronegativity of the P680 go back to normal, which means it's ready to receive another electron. And then now that primary acceptor molecule is happy. It's got that electron. It's not as electronegative anymore. So then it will then pass that on to that PQ or that plastoquinine. And then that electron shuttle process within the thylakoid membrane can go on. And that allows for that electron acceptor uh, to kind of do a couple of things. And we'll, we'll talk about what PQ does as a whole. But essentially, it, things go through like a, if you think of sinusoidal functions from 11U math, their electronegativity goes up and down based on how often they get an electron. So this process occurs twice for each water molecule completely oxidized to form that O2 product molecule. Uh, the reason being is that we have, um, yeah, four hydrogens and four electrons for every oxygen that uh, O2 molecule that is produced. Because when you think of H2O as a whole, in order to get an H, uh, in order to get an O2, you need to have two H2O molecules. So it kind of adds up like that. So this is the process with which electrons move within that primary acceptor or that reaction center from the P680 to the uh, chlorophyll A to PQ. And we'll talk about what PQ does with that electron after because it, it's not quite the last electron acceptor, um, but it's the last one in photosystem two specific to the splitting of our water molecule. Because now we can start to look at chemiosmosis. Now we can start to look at chemiosmosis. And the concept of chemiosmosis we've kind of talked about before. It's that electrochemical gradient that is established across the thylakoid membrane and used to generate ATP. It's going to allow for that difference in concentration and charge within and without a membrane. And as a result of that, that charge can be harnessed to do work. So, so far, everything we've looked at has gone on through here. And I know it's not the most clear picture, but... It's okay. We've split our water molecule. The electrons have been accepted by that P680, then transferred to chlorophyll A, then transferred to PQ. And now we can look at the next steps of what happens once that PQ has that electron, because now we're going to look at an electron transport chain and the harnessing of that energy. So there is, there is a higher proton concentration on the lumen, okay, on the lumen within that thylakoid side of the membrane and a lower pro proton concentration in the stroma, which is outside of that thylakoid membrane. If you think again, back to the similarities to aerobic respiration, the higher hydrogen concentration, you want that higher hydrogen concentration on the outside of that uh, inner membrane of the mitochondria versus the inside, whereas it's flipped here, it's flipped. So that's an interesting little concept to think about in terms of the differences and similarities between photosynthesis, and aerobic respiration. So this electrochemical gradient can be generated by three mechanisms. The first is that plastoquinine, right? That plastoquinine is going to be moving protons from the stroma to the lumen. It actively moves protons from the stroma to the lumen as a result of a, a component of that electrochemical gradient, specifically that electron shuttle process that it provides. The water splitting at photosystem two also releases two protons into the lumen each time that that water molecule is split. And then lastly, removal of hydrogen ions in the stroma as NADP plus accepts hydrogen ions to form NADPH. And then we'll talk about that in the Calvin cycle, but effectively it removes those hydrogen ions in the stroma when the Calvin cycle goes through its, its steps, which we talk about tomorrow. So the higher hydrogen ion concentration in the lumen relative to the stroma allows for ATP synthesis, synthase enzyme used in chemical electrochemical gradient to kind of produce that ATP. Recall, how does electrochemical gradient power ATP synthase? And this is kind of like the smoking gun as far as I'm concerned for the like similarities uh, or common ancestry with regards to uh, eukaryotic life, animal life, plant life, uh, microbiological life, etc. Uh, ATP synthase as a whole, even in plants, which precede, you know, sig uh, larger multicellular organisms like animals, et cetera, by millions of years, they were still using ATP synthase to form that ATP. 
because as those protons move from high to low concentration, they're going to release that free energy used to make ATP. So as those hydrogen ions move through ATP synthase, we're going to look at how that ATP is formed. And again, where have we seen that before? That oxidative phosphorylation in aerobic respiration, the electron transport chain in mitochondria. This is just a kind of like a reversed way with which that it does that, which I think is kind of neat in the context that, um, you know, that we think about those similarities and differences because I, I, it's quite beautiful how the same process happens, just a little bit different in terms of ATP production. So it's going to harness that hydrogen ion concentration and it's going to harness it to make ATP. So that was the electron transport chain specific to how that ion concentration is utilized. Now we're going to look at energy transfer in a light dependent reaction. So we're still dealing with light dependent reactions here. So that energy flow, that energy flow, oops, in photosynthesis is in the opposite direction as in cellular respiration, which we kind of talked to. H2O to NADPH instead of NADH to H2O. When we think about H2O, it's a source of electrons in photosystem two, right? Whereas in, in terms of aerobic respiration, NADH supplies that energy in the electron transport chain or those electrons to allow for that process to go through. So to drive photosynthetic electron transport, we really need to have that energy uh, to pass from electrons of low energy electrons to in H2O to higher energy electrons in NADPH because that movement or that increase in that electric electron energy level will allow for that energy to be harnessed. So where does that come from? Well, it comes from that sunlight absorbed in those pigments in photosystem two as well as photosystem one, which we'll talk a little bit about. So why do we need to know and understand all of these steps and processes in the context of electron transport and how it's going to essentially uh, harness that energy of the sun? Well, if you recall that P680, right, that P680 and then the primary acceptor, that sunlight is absorbed through all those secondary, uh, you know, that secondary acceptors which then transport that, that electron through that bouncing system within that uh, reaction center to P680. That P680 then will also accept some energy from that sunlight, but then also accept electrons from the splitting of that water molecule. So now we're looking at the movement of energy in terms of energy level as a result of that P680 gaining all of that energy in the form of sunlight, electron energy, it's going to move up it's going to move up in terms of energy level of those electrons. And then once it moves up, it's harnessed that energy already. Now it can use that harnessed energy to pass on those electrons that of that higher energy level to the primary acceptor, which will then go to PQ, which will then continue through several different processes until we get to the photosystem one, which we'll talk a little bit about afterwards. Because ultimately, again, the whole premise is about raising that energy level higher and higher every time. So that way we can continue to give as much energy in, the, in those electrons to that NADPH, which can then be utilized to make sugar via the Calvin cycle. So in this note here, in this diagram, the most important component that I want to talk about is that, that as that electron moves down the chain, it loses some energy. It gets re-energized in photosystem one by accepting more sunlight. Okay, so sunlight and, and the splitting of water are the main ways with which those electron transport carriers gain that energy from a lower ground state to a higher excited level. So we've talked a little bit about it in terms of some questions that were asked, but the reaction is non-spontaneous as it requires that constant input of energy via the sun and via the splitting of water. So to understand the context of that, of that material, you have to recognize that uh, the cyclic electron transport, or, or CET, is, is going to have to take place. And we'll talk about what that means in this context. So if there's too much, and this is now we're looking at those, um, 
we're looking at some systems that are put in place as a result to help with those extra amounts of what have you. If NADPH is formed and there's too much of it, that means that light dependent reactions turn to a cyclic electron transport. The next stage of photosynthesis, the Calvin cycle, needs more ATP than it does NADPH. So cyclic electron transport prevents waste. Again, when you think about the things that are similar to aerobic respiration, we now have a negative feedback loop here, which photosynthesis can harness to ensure that the correct amounts of things are both used and saved. So when we look at the Calvin cycle tomorrow, just remember that the key thing that you have to understand about the Calvin cycle is that you need more ATP to be put into it um, than NADPH. Now, the amount of ATP you put into it is less than the ATP you get from those sugars that are eventually turned into energy via aerobic respiration, but it still has to put some energy into it. Again, that idea of spending energy to make energy. So in the stroma, when we're talking about it, specifically H2O, there's a lot of water in that, okay? If we have too much NADPH, we're going to stop that hydrogen or that water splitting. That water splitting is now stopped. And the reason why it's stopping is because we're going to look at how we can utilize that NADPH in order to kind of progress the cyclic electron transport cycle. Because again, we have too much. We have too much NADPH. So let's take a look at the steps in the cyclic electron transport. PS2 is deactivated. So that photosystem 2 is deactivated. PS1 will still function. It is a reversible inhibition of PS2, much like that allosteric inhibition of that PSK or that PFK in our aerobic respiration. PS2 is deactivated and it is reversible. So electrons aren't transferred to NADP+. Okay, this is a very important component that you have to think of because it's not gonna go to that NADP+, it's not gonna make more NADPH, it's gonna take those electrons and pump them back and utilize them with PQ. Because recall back from that stuff we learned earlier, PQ is gonna bring electrons to that cytochrome complex as well as transport those hydrogen ions from the stroma into that lumen using energy released as that electron moves down that electron transport chain. And that's gonna allow for that ATP synthase to create more ATP. So instead of just saving those electrons in the NADPH, it's gonna use that NADPH and it's going to give those electrons from NADPH to that PQ, that plastoquinine, to continue that electron transport chain down to bring more hydrogen ions into the lumen. Those electrons move from that P700 plus in photo or in that PS1 through plastocyanin and they get more excited due to the accessory pigments in the antenna complex. And then as a result of that transferring energy and those excited electrons are passed from P700 to that primary electron acceptor and then back to something called ferrodoxin. The cycle will then continue. So this is, this is the, the electron, that cyclic electron transport cycle. It's very similar, it's very similar to the cycle that we looked at earlier, except instead of creating NADPH as well as ATP, we're just looking at producing ATP because the cell recognizes, hey, I have too much NADPH and we're not, we don't have enough ATP to help facilitate that Calvin cycle, which we'll talk, again talk about later with, to produce those sugars. So instead of making more NADPH, I'm gonna stop making NADPH and I'm gonna reuse those electrons to produce more of a concentration gradient to allow for that ATP synthase to make more ATP. So the cyclic electron transport and the chemiosmosis and ATP synthase are very, they use the exact same systems. It's just they both operate under different circumstances and different environments. So it's really good to think about it in terms of how the environment impacts the cellular cycles as a whole. So it's very important to think about it in this context because there's still a proton gradient that's being creative, right? We still want to establish that in that cyclic electron transport cycle. Those hydrogen ions are still transported through ATP synthase to produce ATP. 
The energy absorbed from light is converted into chemical energy and stored in that ATP. But what doesn't happen during the cyclic electron transport? We're not splitting water at that PS2. There's no photon absorbed there. And we're not creating NADPH. Okay, so we're not creating that NADPH. It's just a subtle tweak to that entire system, that chemiosmosis system. But in this, in this case, we're just making ATP. Okay, folks, that's it for this lesson for the day. Uh, I give you some time to ask questions and digest that information now. So please use that time wisely. And I'll be more than happy to answer questions as we go through the day.